Uh, the new relationship with clients. I've got a new client this week and it's such a joyous feeling, isn't it? Every, everybody loves everybody. Everybody's kind and polite. Everybody's showing their best self. They think you're some kind of exotic genius because you're a web person uh, and you know stuff about tech and then things start to get a little iffy and it starts with very subtle signs and it ends up with you flirting with seek.com. Any, anyone opened seek recently? Yeah, some honest people, thank you. Um, and it turns out you might have snagged a lemon. So I'm Brooke McCarthy, there's no E on Brooke, if you remember that, you'll be my best mate forever. Uh, I'm a business coach, please don't hold that against me. I'm a marketing mentor for creative values based business owners. I've been uh, self-employed since 2008, which makes me happily unemployable, hopefully for the rest of my life. I no longer flirt with Seek, it's not really an option, I just never ever imagine having a job ever again. Uh, and I help business owners to leverage their expertise into assets to claim back their time and to earn more while working less. I realise that sounds like a bit of a pipe dream. I've been told that sounds like a bit of a get-rich-quick scheme. It's like, but I don't get it. You know, how am I supposed to bloody earn more if I'm working fewer hours? Well, this is what we're going to talk about today. Most importantly, over 16, almost 17 years of running my own show, I have made all of the mistakes and I'm a slow learner so it took me many years of repeating those mistakes until eventually I learnt my lesson slowly, slowly and I started changing things up. And the birth of two babies uh, in quick succession, number two was a whoopsie. Uh, it turns out that the mini pill doesn't work unless you actually take it. Um, that's when the wheels fell off because I came from public relations. So when I started my business in 2008, I set up my business from the industry I'd come from, which I think is pretty normal, right? We do what we know, we do what's familiar to us. Um, and I had a small number of retainer clients that I would service year in, year out for many years. Uh, my primary skills are writing, not uh, website design, but I had a subcontracted team of branding people, graphic designers, web designers, SEO and everybody else. But it really quickly became apparent that, you know, this was no longer working anymore. My partner is also self-employed. Um, we had a mortgage. God, it was fun. I'm still getting flashbacks. I still get anxious at times when the memories come flooding back. But I'm happy to say that things have turned around and we are now living the laptop lifestyle. Uh, with plenty of holidays, because if you can't take holidays as a self-employed person, what is the point, really? So I'm guessing that you're here today because you want to earn more money. Anyone? Yay. Sydney's expensive, right? Uh, working with clients who are a pleasure, who perhaps form a mutual admiration society with you. You respect them, they respect you. There's no weird power dynamics. There's no strange passive aggressiveness. And you're willing to make bold moves in, to make this happen, right? Because that's necessary. It's not enough to listen to me and go, oh, that sounds like a good idea, and then walk out of here and nothing changes. Yeah, you know that already. You've got to actually be willing to do something different. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover levelling up. We're going to cover calling in your ideal clients. I'm going to touch on marketing a little because I'm a marketer, um, but I'm also going to focus on proposals, your proposals, and new ways of delivering your services. And then we're going to end up talking about boundaries and standards, which might be my favourite topics ever, apart from what am I going to eat next. <laughs> so I want to kind of start with what charging premium doesn't mean, because there's a lot of myths and misconceptions. It doesn't mean that you put on an expensive pair of sunglasses that you borrowed from a friend and a navy suit, and for women, you wear the big flowery dress with the big heels or perhaps you prefer the red power suit. It doesn't mean that. Yeah, you don't have to have $10,000 branding, although that's lovely, to charge premium. It doesn't mean that you need to go and get yet another PhD in self-worth from the University of Credibility. Ask me how I know. I have a master's. I have to keep slipping that into conversation because otherwise it was just a complete waste of money. <laughs> um, but it was fun. It also doesn't mean, and this is a big one, overstuffing your package. If I'm going to charge more, 
I'm intimidated. I'm thinking, I can't believe they're paying me this. You know, oh, I better like give them all the stuff and overwhelm them and blow out the you know project to take months and years. And this is not what charging premium means, because premium clients will happily pay more because they value time more than money, right? That makes sense. DIYers, we value uh, money more than time. We're happy to take hours and hours to do something rather than pay somebody else to do it for us. So how do we actually go about doing this? I put this picture up of myself on purpose and look, I'm wearing the same earrings um, because it is, you know, a little bit annoying this photo quite frankly and so I do that on purpose I, I put things out in my marketing designed to repel people designed to repel people that you know find that face annoying <laughs> <laughs> so step number one is we have to be brave we have to stop playing it so safe in our marketing this was turned into a Facebook ad recently I can't remember what party this was. My parents are great at parties. I come from a family that take parties very seriously. It could have been my sister's wedding. I'm not sure. But it's important that we embrace our differences because being different is better than being better. There is no such thing as good, better, best unless you're an Olympic athlete. I wasted years in the early days trying to benchmark myself. Yeah. Am I good? Am I very good? Am I great? Am I excellent? This is a waste of time. It's not possible to figure this out. And what other people ever had the experience of your best mate says, I've got this friend, you're going to love them. And they bring this friend along and you're like, I hate this person. <laughs> yeah? So there's somebody for everybody. It's not about like how good am I, how legitimately good am I. It's about how different am I. So I put out marketing designed to repel people because the stuff that I put out that repels people works really well to attract people. That's how magnets work, right? People put, come in and go, wow, you know, and at the same time other people are like, not for me, scroll on past. So the more you can turn up the volume on your opinion, the more you can put a stake in the ground and say, I stand for this, I stand against this, the better your marketing is going to work. You just heard a presentation on AI. What's AI doing to marketing? It is just sending an avalanche of same, same, not different, how to suck eggs content. So how do we compete with this avalanche, with this age of information saturation? We've got to stand out. We've got to say something worth listening to. We've got to be bold. We've got to be brave. And when I say develop your thinking, what I mean by that is if you're constantly on the internet consuming information, you're never allowing yourself time to actually think things through. In 2024 and beyond, because this year is almost over, we have to carve out time space to actually think without a device. So we need to share our point of view. We need to get that balance between consumption and creation more, you know, more in a mood. Um, number two, super important is you want to invest in your self-trust, your attitude and mood and your sales skills. Can I have a quick show of hands if you've been self-employed for five years or longer? Ten years or longer? Great. So the people with their hands in the air and the five-year people, had a bad day, a little, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> had a few crises, yeah, yeah, had a bit of burnout. If you haven't been burnt out in business yet, I dare say it's because you haven't been employed long enough. And I, I'm not saying that to encourage you. I'm saying that hopefully, you know, go and get burnt out. I'm, I'm saying that to normalise this kind of stuff. I can track my mental health in my profit and loss statement over the last 16 years. Yeah? Does that sound familiar? Great. So we know this. We know mental health has a lot to do with how much money you earn. And joy powers people, powers business. Yeah? People do business with people 
And we are not robots. We work on the internet. It is not an easy place to work. I don't know about you, but over 16 years, my concentration and focus has gone <laughs> Uh, it's not good for my, my mental health. It's not good for my brain health. I worked in social media marketing for several years in the early days, 2009, 10, 11, 12. And my quality of thinking declined. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyone gone on a social media bender and you're like, I've just fried my brain. And then you're dreaming about the internet. Yeah, having conversations with randoms you don't know. Um, so people gravitate towards people who are enthusiastic, present, and as my kids would say, a mood. Yeah? There is something inherently attractive about somebody who's enthusiastic. There is something that's very, you know, you kind of want to be in their, in their vicinity, right? Because I'm certain, I know for certain that I've won jobs not because I'm the cheapest, not because I'm the best, or that my technical skills are the, you know, the most wonderful, but because I'm easy to deal with, because they're going to be hanging around with me, they're going to be communicating with me. So they want this to be a pleasant experience, right? This is important. It doesn't seem important on the surface of it, perhaps when you first start especially, but it absolutely definitely has an impact. I want to share this screenshot because this was in the middle of a promotion. I was running a promotion. I'd set a target to make three sales a goal of three sales, I made 10 sales and I was driving from Sydney to Canberra to have dinner with some clients and these, my phone kept pinging, sale, sale, and I'm like, oh, well, I think I'd better stop the car by the side of the road and just whip up a little Instagram live. And you can see the joy in my face. I'm booking my next holiday. Can you see it reflected in my eyes? <laughs> I'm like, it's Fiji, baby. So there is something inherently uh, attractive about this. You can't get on the internet and sell and promote if you're like, yeah? There's, you can watch people on video. You've probably seen it before and you're like, there's something a bit iffy about their energy. I don't think they're quite believable. I'm not going to buy from that person. You have to fall in love with your offers. You have to fall in love with your business over and over and over again. Anybody charged a price before where you're like, your heart's beating and you're like, your voice is all stuck up here. Anyone been in that situation? Awesome. Well done. It is scary. It is intimidating. Congratulations for putting yourself in an uncomfortable position. Uh, if you're finding it intimidating, you have to trust that you will rise to meet it. Because every time I increase my price, Every time I, you know, charge more than I'm kind of initially comfortable with, I trust that I will rise to meet it. I trust that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do a really excellent job. And this is absolutely critical because otherwise we just send ourselves into burnout once again. It doesn't make sense. All right. Anyone heard of values-based pricing? Awesome. Anyone charge values-based pricing at the moment? Anyone like, I want to, but I've got no idea what it is? Sounds like a good idea, but can somebody please explain it to me? <laughs> okay, great. So let's talk about uh, communicating value because this is the difference, right? The price is the least interesting part. The, the difference is the value. And when I say the price is the least interesting part, I've had clients who've said no to me. No, thank you. Actually, most people don't say no because apparently no is a dirty word. They say, oh, you know my bank account can't quite support you right now or some weird thing like that. Um, or they tell me I'm the most expensive. They got three quotes and I was the most expensive and then they come back and they say yes. Yeah. The price is the least important part. The value is way more interesting. Now I'm going to talk through this. If you want to grab yourself a copy of Pricing for Value Cheat Sheet, it talks through um, you know, what to include uh, some words that you might use to kind of convey value, to signify value, to signify um, that kind of premium positioning that we're talking about. Again, remember, it's not about your branding colours, it's not about your branding fonts, although I love a good font. Um, it's about way more than that. So how I structure it, and the structure I believe is important, is that we start off with all about them because who is the most interesting thing, who are we interested in the most? Ourselves. 
what is the most popular or, you know, best word in the English language? You. Yeah, we love you. I remember when I was young and I was in public relations and I was in this marketing meeting, you know, full of intimidating people for the first time ever. And the ad agency like presented to the client and they kept saying, we and our, and I'm like, I'm so confused. You don't work for the client. But they did, you know, they made the client feel like, hey, we're all in this together. So focus on them. What is their current situation? What is their desired future state? What are the outcomes of the benefits? Not just the features. We're not talking about features at this point. We're talking about benefits. But most important, importantly, we are painting pictures in people's minds. This is the outcome of the benefits. If you were to receive this benefit, what would happen if your website traffic doubled? Spell it out for them. Paint them a picture. Paint them a scenario. Second, of course, we have the scope. We need the scope. We need the inclusions. We need a rough timeline. We need those magical words, you know, this stage happens after I have received all the information that I need from you because isn't that the most frustrating part? Then we have the price and key terms and conditions. Number four, we have the one, two, three, four process. Why is it important to include a little bit about the process? It doesn't have to be hugely detailed. Why do you believe, why do you think it could be useful, it is useful, to include a process? To structure the transformation. To structure the transformation? Great. Anyone else? Manage expectations. Manage expectations. Say again. <laughs> we all want it yesterday. Um, yes, and it shows them that you are a professional, you have a process. You're not just somebody like a, a brilliant branding person, great designer that I hired once who, you know, gave me a beautiful design. I'm not complaining about that. But her process was an email. So what do you want? <laughs> I'm like, huh? You're making this hard. So we want a process because it shows that you are a professional. You've done this a thousand times before. You are in charge. You're going to lead the process. You're going to lead the relationship. And then you need a call to action. Uh, could be a link to the contract and then this is really important anyone had somebody come back like years after you sent them a proposal and say I'm ready I'm ready now yeah yeah me too and it was a small job too I was like huh go away um, so what do you think the most important piece of your proposal document is then how are you going to solve their problem I love that I love that you want to centre them. And one of the things I do as a business coach, one of my most fun things that I do is I collect other people's proposals because it helps me understand. And I'm that impertinent person that says, so do you mind if I ask how much you paid for that thing? Do you mind if I ask how much you charged? Because how can I be helpful to my clients if I don't ask those impertinent questions? Uh, but you'd be amazed by how many proposals where it's like me, 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 me. And then the client is like, you know, a kind of an afterthought. Start the proposal centering them. Put the spotlight on them. And you're talking about the value, the outcomes, the benefits. Yeah? You're, you're painting pictures of that ideal end state, that transformation that they're going to get once they start working with you. So benefits before features, that's not new information. Hopefully you've heard that a thousand times before, but take it a few steps further. Use these phrases, these connecting phrases, so that you and in order to. So you're saying increase web traffic, higher Google ranking, you know, whatever the benefit is, and then spell out the outcome of that. Because sometimes people lack imagination. If they lack imagination, you're going to have to colour in the details. You're going to have to use your imagination instead. And then the value of not taking action, which is you stay where you are. And I wouldn't necessarily write this in the proposal, but this is something that you'd say verbally because it's hard to have, you know, it's hard to say, hey, you suck, um, in words, you know, but you can, you can be a little bit more subtle and skillful when you're in a sales conversation with them. So you're going to stay where you are, the competition is going to outpace you, you're leaving money on the table, and then the value of brand perception. So most importantly, why you, why this, why now? Yeah, why you, why is your 
your agency, your business so much better than everybody else's, the framework, the, you know, the, uh, the proprietary process, all those fancy thousand dollar words. Why this? Why this particular project and why now? Why does it need to happen now? And November is a funny month, right? It's a magical month for business owners because you're either going to make a of money or, you know, you're going to work yourself into Christmas, crash, lie prone, recuperating for many, many weeks. And then late January, you're like, ah, I guess I should do something about getting some leads. So November's really good to get the the uh, proposals out to get the commitment in to get the deposit taken and to say things such as you'll be first in the queue when January when we're back at the desk in January or February or whatever that is yeah you have to give them that reason of now now November is when I need your deposit I need your commitment so just quickly I want to talk about a few ways to refine your process. Can anybody tell me what the most painful part, and I'm, I'm making a few assumptions that everybody's a, a website designer here, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Put your hands in the air if you identify as a website designer developer. Great. Uh, put your hands in the air if you identify as a freelancer. Fantastic. An agency owner. Awesome. Great. So there's lots of ways that we can go about this, right? But when the relationship starts, when the new client relationship starts, what's the most painful thing in your words, in your experience? Yes. Oh, my God. Gathering content. I need that login details. There's an email in your inbox. Click the link. Um, that part's painful, right? It's really painful and you can't do anything and you're just sitting there going, come on, please send the stuff. So the VIP day is an entry point and then the recurring intensives that take the place of a retainer. What's the difference between a recurring intensive and a retainer? A retainer means you're losing your mind because they're constantly calling, right? They're emailing, they have a brain fart, they're having a bad day. They heard some random piece of wacky information and they want to confirm that they shouldn't do the thing and they feel like they own you, right? Or it starts to feel that way. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> Whereas a recurring intensive or a VIP day is a really tight, boundaried container and you can set up your processes, your automation, so that it's like this is the day, yeah? This is the day that I work on your stuff. You have to get this to me by such and such a day, otherwise nothing happens or otherwise I try. But regardless, you're being, you're paying, yeah, because this is your day and you're paying for that day. So you have to crack the whip, absolutely. The other part then, the other possibility then is we scope out the proposal and then divide by 12 months. So a lot of my smart, smart clients are doing this where it's a $20,000 job, yeah, but that's a big amount of money. And rather than take a 50%, which again is a big amount of money, you turn it into a recurring monthly amount. Now, if you've got a $20,000 job, yeah, the client doesn't want to wait 12 months to get a brand new website. So I want you to think about, and this is true, whatever services, whatever you're selling, how can we give people a quick win up the front? Even the way I structured this presentation, I'm, it's designed to give you a quick win up the front, yeah? Because we've got the attention span of a goldfish and we need something to keep us engaged. So give the client a one-page website at the beginning of the 12 months while you're building out the Mercedes-Benz of websites in the back end, yeah? Give them the quick win, help them along the path, give them those things so that they're not t waiting 12 months to finally receive the value. The other possibility, can I have a quick show of hands who's doing something like a VIP day or a recurring intensive? Fabulous. Go and talk to these women after. Um, website in a weekend, website in a week, anyone doing something similar? Fantastic. Awesome. So this is a workshop to kick it off, which works really well because you're in front of the client and you can talk them through the questions that they can't be bothered or they're overwhelmed answering in a form, right? I love forms but most people don't like answering them, which is true. I like sending them, I don't like answering them too. 
So uh, that's another possibility. And of course, then we've got things like Voxer, we've got things like Telegram, we've got things like WhatsApp, you know, that we're able to deliver our services through. I'm working with an American at the moment, I'm working with a Lebanese woman. You know, we can communicate via Voxer. Um, and I can boundary that as well and say, you know, I'll, I'll respond on Friday to whatever you sent me through the week. All right, this is the fun stuff. So boundaries and standards, why are these important? The hint is in the picture. Yeah, we're looking after our mental health. You've got to model the behaviour that you expect from others. And as the eldest of four children, I'm, you know, and my parents complimented me by calling me biddable, which is a terrible compliment, um, I had to unlearn a lot of things because I was really quick. I was, you know, I was eager to please. An email had come in in the early days. I'd be like, let me respond. Let me give you everything I need. I had one client who wanted their new website live on Christmas Eve. Don't ask me why. An idiot me made it happen. So you need to back yourself and you need to pick yourself up over and over and over and over again. And it's hard. I know it's hard. It's exhausting. Get a therapist. Therapists are great. You're a finite resource. You are one person and you probably only have five to six good hours in the day before you move on to the dirge, yeah, the low value kind of stuff. So your attitude is your biggest business asset and it will have an indelible impact on your profit and loss. So levelling up means that you're raising your own standards and boundaries as to what you tolerate and what you don't tolerate. So a few things to talk about, like, you know, if you haven't considered them already, the phone number on the website kind of kills me. Who wants to be called by random people? at random times. Does anybody ever see your client's name on your phone, they're calling you and then your heart starts to race harder? Yeah? So be careful. Yeah, this is a sign. This is a sign that we need to be careful. Remove those details. Have the forms instead, have different forms for different services. Consider how you deliver your services. And then your processes and boundaries need to be communicated everywhere so that every time a client acts weirdly, they do something unexpected, you know, something that's less than stellar, you go back to your proposal, you go back to your process, back to your contracts, and you rewrite, you dummy proof. We're trying to dummy proof our business to repel those people and make sure it doesn't happen again. Standards. One of my, you know, my, one of my values is classy. I like classy people. I consider myself classy. Um, kind. You know, again, hopefully that doesn't need explaining. We want to model the behaviour that we wish to encourage. You know, the phone rings on a Saturday. Um, you know, we get the email at 6pm Friday evening saying, I need this. You know, what do you do? You ignore it. It's easy. Don't answer the phone. Don't respond to the email. Because despite making it clear and obvious, you still have to enforce those boundaries. And that's the heart, much harder than just having the boundary in the first place. The red flag list, the first one uh, is the forms on the website. If you can't be bothered filling out the forms, I can't be bothered talking to you. If, if you say, one of my questions is, are you prepared to invest in your business right now? If they mark no, I cancel the phone call because if you can't be bothered to invest, I can't be bothered to talk to you. You know, you, you can help yourself to all my free fabulous resources on my website, but, you know, why on earth are we talking? if you don't have money to invest. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, a green flag list. So one of my questions on my forms is, who's your favourite musician? Yes, I do judge people if they say, you know, I can't help myself, I'm only human. But that's not the point of, you know, do we match, uh, do, our, do our musical taste match? The point of that question is, if you respond and say, I don't understand the point of this question, which I, one or two people have done, where you're like, not my person, bye. So you can have your own, your own question. It might be, what do you think about Donald Trump? You know, depending on the answer. So have a green flag list as well as a red flag list and then put out marketing designed to repel people. It will work a treat to attract your people, your mutual admiration society. So I want to end with 
this, is modesty is a learned affectation. That's a hard word to pronounce. I always have to think about it before I jump into it. Modesty is dangerous. Yeah, babies, toddlers, we're not born modest. We're not born self-deprecating. It's something that we are taught. And when people insult you, when people say certain things to you, they say it because they're trying to censor your behaviour. They're trying to get you to behave differently. Yeah? My, my parents, for example, like calling me mercenary. I'm thinking about getting a necklace that says mercenary bitch so that they stop. Yeah? So a lot of what we're talking about here is about that perfect fit person. It's about the fact that we're not all going to be friends, right? You're going to meet some people and there's just something about them. You're like, just don't trust you. I don't like you. We don't gel. It's not their fault. It's not your fault. You just don't work together. And I believe that this ideal client idea, it's not just a smart sounding, attractive sounding phrase. It's actually really, really important because your ideal clients value what you do more than what it costs. They are happy to pay full price. They're perfectly placed to get the most out of working with you. They share similar values to you, though they might look different to you. They might be a different kind of demographic to you. Because they're perfectly placed to get the most out of working with you, they get the most value. Because they get the most value, it becomes this self-perpetuating success. They tell everybody, they write glowing testimonials, and they bring more of the same awesome type person. And perhaps most importantly, they are good for your mental health, which is good for your business's bottom line. So you are an ideal person. You're an ideal business owner for someone, yeah? And it's, oh, it's kind of stopped on me all of a sudden. It's personal, but it's also not personal. What do I mean by that? Well, they're only going to see one fraction of you, right? And they're going to make a quick judgment call. They're not the people that are going to turn up at your funeral. They're not the people that are your nearest and dearest inner sanctum. So, yes, it's personal, but try not to take it too personally at the same time. Oh, it's frozen on me. So, that is that. Does anyone have any questions? I think I've got a couple of moments more. If anyone has anything they'd like to say, you might say, this is b I've tried to charge more and people won't pay it. What about the cost of living crisis? Thanks for that, Brooke. Um, you're speaking my language. I really, really enjoyed and resonated with that. Um, I have a situation where I'm currently sitting on about four or five projects that are fully paid up front. Yep. And they've disappeared. Um, either they haven't even started um, or midway through they've just disappeared. And short of thinking they're gun runners or, you know, <laughs> It's not a very comfortable spot to be in. No. It's sort of like, you know, it sounds like, well, you've got a lot of money, but when they do resume, or how do I take on more projects not knowing when they're all coming back? Yep, yep. Anyone had this experience? Yeah. Yep, great. Look around the room, see all the hands in the air. So really, really common. It's very strange behaviour, and it happens even when I had a client who's a digital agency owner. She said I'd taken, like, all of the money. They had a completed website on our server, and they just disappeared. So they got like a completed website, but for one reason or another, they're having an existential crisis and they disappeared. So um, you can never communicate too much. And I would make one, two, three attempts with the same language every time of I need this from you by this date in order to proceed here. And you're going to lose your spot in the queue, so to speak. And if you've done that one, two, three times, I would be feeling perfectly fine to put them to one side and pursue new projects, yeah? Um, and definitely not give money back because they've decided that they don't want a business anymore or whatever reason. Um, great presentation, very funny as well, so thank you very much. And I wanted to ask, uh, so making mistakes is human. 
Yes. And if you make a series of mistakes uh, in a project, how would you go about, and the client is rightfully angry, how would you deal with that situation so that they're not, exactly, so that they don't uh, disrespect you or so that they, how do you heal the relationship? Uh, that's really tricky for you personally, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, and isn't it fun running your own business? Bloody hell. It's such a challenge for your own, you know, self-development and self-esteem. Um, I think that actually the way that you deal with something that's less than fabulous can bring you further ahead in somebody else's self-esteem than if nothing had happened in the first place. So what I mean by that is be classy, acknowledge that there's been a problem, there's been a mistake, um, and then tell them exactly what you're going to do to rectify them because they don't need you going, oh, I feel terrible, I feel terrible. They need to know when is it going to be fixed, you know, and how is it going to be fixed and what are you going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again, yeah? But um, this is an opportunity because I've had lots of tense situations and when I've handled it well, then the client, my, you know, the estimation in their eyes has gone up. Look after yourself. Thank you, Brooke. Um, I've heard from quite a few people lately who want to up their prices. You know, yes. cost of living, everything's gone crazy. You've got old clients that are on old rates. How would you approach increasing your prices with existing clients? It's always easier to sort of, you know, put out a proposal for a new client, but with the existing clients, how would you go about that? Uh, yeah, so this is pretty much why most people hire me because they kind of know that they need to raise their prices and they're, you know, scared to do so. Uh, I think giving people a bit of heads up, definitely. And it, when I say heads up, I don't mean waiting till June 30 or July 1 or January 1 even, that's not what I mean. But give people what you deem to be a reasonable amount of time. And then you want to be brief. You don't want to go on so long that it reads like an apology. And you want to focus on the benefits or the improvements or the additions, the, the good things. Don't talk about the cost of living. Don't talk about your expenses. Nobody cares. Sorry. But no one cares. You know, it's not great marketing. It's not great communication to say, oh, you know, things are terrible. Things are terrible. You know, support our business because we're going broke. It's not, you know, it's not a great, a great sentiment. And you tend to attract weird clients. Um, so, yeah, focus on the benefits, focus on how awesome it's going to be, focus on the additional kind of stuff, so to speak, that they're going to get um, through continuing to work with you. Um, I prefer bonuses to discounts, um, so you might consider giving them some kind of bonus. Yeah. Is there a limit to how, you, how much you can raise your price? I raised my price 50% this year. Uh, it's not uncommon. Like, I do stuff like that all the time. Um, I think your prices need to rise in comparison with your other prices. So depending what you're selling, if you're raising the price of one thing, you almost always have to raise the price of the other because you're trying to, you know, coach people to make the purchase that you want them to make. So think about your prices as in, you know, as in relation to your other prices rather than in relation to your, you know, your clients. And I would suggest that most people make the mistake of incremental price increases. They hate it. Business owners hate it. Clients hate it. And so what are you doing? Well, you're just spreading out the pain. You, like you're ripping off the Band-Aid really slowly and painfully rather than just going rip 50%. Um, yeah, because a lot of us, you know, are massively undercharging. And if you're earning less in your business, you're taking home less money than you would do in a commensurate uh, employed role, then something is severely wrong because you're taking on a shit ton of stress that you wouldn't have in a normal job. Yeah? Not to mention the holiday pay, sick pay, all the rest of it, superannuation. Uh, I think there's one more question up there. All right, we'll take this last one. As um, Ocean Alley seeing confidence and Lyme Cordy will have imposter syndrome, as they want to How would you deal with pricing? Is it on the website? Is it off the website? Because one of my challenges I find is 
I had this issue where I, I believe I actually did really good work, mm. but I don't know, I just can't break through that ceiling and I yeah. keep on falling back into that price level. And I find so do you mind sharing with, yeah, with people okay. what the ceiling is? Is the ceiling so a my website? The ceiling is, I liked like 3,000. Yep. Okay. The amount of work that goes into them, yep. I go above and beyond all the time. What do you want the price to be? 10. Great. Did everybody hear that? And yeah, I have actually gone in with proposals at yep. that level. Yeah. And crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have your name? James. James is increasing his website design prices. Did you hear it here first, folks? To ten thousand dollars a website. Can we have a show? Can we have a Um, can I ask you to raise your hand if you put your prices on your website? Great. And if you haven't put your price on your, web on your website, and if you feel strongly that you shouldn't put your price on your website, okay, awesome. So um, it's a personal thing. Uh, generally speaking, what I say to clients is it's how comfortable you feel having sales conversations. If you are comfortable and you enjoy sales conversations, you'll probably be good at it in which case you might not put your price on your website. If you're a bloody liability, you go into a negotiation and you're just always coming, yeah, then you can really easily get around that problem by putting the price on the website. I put my prices on my website in 2012 as part of that, you know, mental breakdown. And overnight my stress halved, my cash flow problems went away and it's joyous. So the highest price on my website is 15,000. The lowest price on my website, I think, is $9. And, you know, personally, so far, so good. Great. Well, thank you, Brooke, without an E. <laughs> <laughs> that was also quite a great question to end with, just to get everyone thinking practically, I think. Um, we, uh, can we get a huge show of hands? Thank you.